One hot day in 1922, a young man called John Poole strolled across this Sussex Down. He was the victim of a First World War gas attack and he came here looking for fresh air and a bit of peace. But what he found may be one of the very few Stone Age settlements ever discovered in England. But he wasn't an archaeologist, he was a 23-year-old gramophone salesman, which made him highly unpopular with the archaeological elite. His work was sneered at, his finds were lost, this site was bulldozed, and in a tragic twist of fate, John Poole was murdered. Now, 80 years after he first set foot on this hill, Time Team have come here to reassess his work. Is this really the site of a prehistoric village? And what about the mysterious second site, which he recorded but is now lost? Time Team have got just three days to find out. Blackpatch Hill is in West Sussex on the South Downs. Thousands of years of intense prehistoric activity have left their mark on these hills. There are traces of Neolithic flint mines, Bronze Age farms and Iron Age enclosures on virtually every slope. Which makes it all the harder to understand why we've come to one of the few places with absolutely nothing to see. I don't get it, Miles. There's lumps and bumps all over the place, as far as the eye can see, except here. Yeah, this whole area was landscaped in the 1950s. They bulldozed it, and it's been ploughed ever since. So what do you think might be here? What I think is here is one of the most important prehistoric sites in the country. That just tripped off the tongue, didn't it? It did, it did indeed. Evidence? Um, well, effectively, in the 1920s, a local archaeologist, John Poole, uh, investigated at least 100 flint mine shafts in this field over to our right. These are shafts cut right down into the chalk to extract the flint. This is his map? This is his map here, yes. So it's this, this way around, yeah? Yeah. And what he found on the other side is a whole range of, of mounds containing human burial deposits. And beyond that, what he calls uh, a range of dwelling pits. Do you think they are dwelling pits? Well, they're scoops in the ground that contain um, domestic rubbish, animal bones, flint scrapers, a whole range of material. So they could be. Francis, do you think we've got houses here? Well, I don't know, Tony. Um, if we have, it's fantastic, but they could be all sorts of other things. They could be barrows, they could be where trees have gone over, or they could just be spoil heaps from the mines over there. I mean, if they are dwellings, then they're as rare as hen's teeth. So it sounds like there's a real archaeological prize to be won. It's just that it's a heck of a big size. Yeah, well, that's the problem with what we've got here. I mean, this is the, the only evidence we've got of it on this map, and, of course, it's, it's not particularly to scale. If you said to me, where are we now, we're sort of... <laughs> somewhere, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. So mm -hmm. if John Paul was right, and if the whole site hasn't been trashed by thousands of years of human activity or by the bulldozer, then we could find some fantastic archaeology. But that's an awful lot of ifs, isn't it? And the first big if is that map. And that group of flint mines is that group there on Paul's plan. Stuart and Henry have been trying to make sense of it for the last two hours. The road bends off round there, whereas in the real world the road goes off. We know the Neolithic houses are somewhere in this field on Long Furlong Farm. I mean, the problem I've got though, this is a six hectare field. I mean, but pinpointing their positions proving tricky. And I think that ring ditch might be this ring ditch that's shown on Paul's plan. At last though, they think they've cracked it which means that geophys can get to work. They're looking for a series of barrows and houses that could be up to 6,000 years old. What have you got there? What's all the interest all of a sudden? <laughs> <laughs> and the results look promising. At least one clear ring and Ooh, maybe wow. a second ring to the north. Crikey! I just wonder if that could be B9. So in the top one, it's going to be B6. But, but the thing is, B6 didn't have a, a ring ditch around it, so you might well have a, a completely new feature undetected by pull. We've also got these areas of disturbance to this side, and that could actually go with the dwellings. But we need to get some trenches in across this bigger ring ditch to see if it is B9, mm. and across that other um, possible ring ditch. Not 
number one, Francis. Number one. Number one. Number one. Lucky old me. So our first target is what appears to be a ring barrow. Perhaps the same one excavated by John Poole in the 1920s. Phil's opening a second trench over a feature that looks like it could be another ring barrow. And Bridge is investigating an area of disturbance that we hope marks the spot of the Neolithic houses. See, look, now look, can't concentrate. There you go, there's a ditch. Well, is it? If this is the ditch that John Paul excavated, then it could be the first step towards understanding and building on his work. Yes, that bit at the end That's... there that needs to. The extraordinary discoveries he made across the Sussex Downs were thanks to his passion for prehistoric archaeology, a passion that took over his life and his family. Do you remember him going on these digs? He was digging most of my life, really. I mean, we all went digging um, sometimes, or we went to uh, have the social life at the top and do the picnics and uh, collect the blackberries and while he and the, his party of friends were down the mines. I always like the clothes, though, because yeah. you so often see pictures of him down yeah. the mine in, 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 in a very suit. smartly dressed, yes, yeah. in his suit. Where's your... Then, I have an idea, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I like your hat. Yes. Yeah. So, were there a lot of finds stored in your house? Oh, yes. My cousin used to come and stay and Claude was underneath the bed. That was one of the skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> How did he possibly earn his living and do all that archaeology? It's only since he's died this, we really think, how did he? Because really virtually running two jobs. Mm -hmm. He worked at the post office, but he also went to meetings, he lectured. All right, hard question. Was he a good archaeologist? Yes, I think he was. I think he was an excellent archaeologist. Then if he was a good archaeologist, how come the archaeological powers that be slagged him off? Because he was a working class archaeologist, because he was self-educated, because archaeology in Sussex was controlled to a very large extent by two doctors, the doctors Kerwin, who, as far as I can tell, were a pair of self-righteous snobs who turned up on site in a Rolls Royce, I was told recently. Not surprisingly, they didn't want a self-educated post office worker stealing their thunder. A poisonous campaign followed. His work was hijacked, his techniques criticised. He was even accused of looting. He must have found it incredibly hurtful. Yes, I think he did. I think it went very deep, but he pulled himself together and went off still digging and exploring. There was still a lot to be found. What did he do in his final years? <laughs> he was still working as a bank guard, and uh, that's how the end came. So What happened? Uh, he was shot and killed there. Was somebody trying to, to rob the He'd only been at it for, what, three months. He put his hand up, apparently, and... Uh, this fellow turned on him and shot him. It just hits you, you just can't imagine anything like that, you know, especially in a place like Worthing. We just didn't deal in crime in those days. Do you think work still needs to be done to reinstate him and his archaeology? Yes. However good an archaeologist he was, that was 1922, and techniques have come mm. a heck of a long way. I mean, just having geophysics on the site, I'm mm. sure he would yeah, have relished. Love that. Yeah. Beryl, if he's like any of the archaeologists that I know, his spirit will be hovering <laughs> over us, going, no, put that trench there. No, don't dig in that field. Dig in that <laughs> that's, field. That's what my daughter, she said, I do hope he's looking down and seeing all that's <laughs> being done now. <laughs> Right now, we're looking for the Neolithic houses he said he found somewhere on Long Furlong Farm. He thought these were small circular huts cut into the chalk and that they were home to the flint miners, a kind of prehistoric pit village. If this is one of the houses he discovered, we should see loose soil from where he backfilled his trenches. You got anything, Bridge? Absolutely nothing, <laughs> John. All we seem to have here is natural chalk. You know, the way that's been laid down, that is not backfill, that is just decayed chalk. Look, a discoidal scraper, it's just come out of the topsoil and the grass. So we have got something here. Yep. It's lovely, isn't it? Look, you can see there, where the, it's the working edge, isn't it? Yep. And just held it and used it like that. <laughs> You're going to have to have another look. Wicked. Oh, come on, it's in the topsoil. Oh, yeah, I think that's a victory as far as I'm <laughs> <laughs> You would. <laughs> but let's face it, it's hardly evidence of a prehistoric pit village. It's more likely to have come from the massive mining complex just across the track that was discovered and dug by John Paul. Our scraper undoubtedly came from one of these shafts, sunk in search of the precious seams of flint that run through the chalk. What would it have looked like if we'd been 
walking over this landscape 6,000 years ago? Well, it would have looked radically different. We'd be walking through a really pockmarked, almost moonscape series of craters. And would those craters have been very deep? Uh, yes, indeed. Some of them would have been uh, extremely deep, going down six or seven metres. Victor, you've uh, had a crack at wow. recreating what you think it would have been like. How does that look to you? That looks fantastic, actually, Victor. That looks spot on. Thank you. And you got it from this photo? <laughs> I based it on that, roughly. And there, there's the man himself. Yeah. How would they have dug chambers like that? Well, it would have been a very difficult process, given the, the technology of the time. Cheers, um, much of the sort of the initial digging would have been done with bone uh, and, and wooden tools. And really, the, the state-of-the-art tool type of the time was this. Is this something that John Paul actually excavated himself? Yes, this is a, a deer antler and the, the pointy end would have been hardened in the fire and this would have been used to pick away at the chalk or to leave a blocks of flint up. So this would have, all this digging would have been done with something as simple but effective as this. It would have been incredibly hard work, yeah. Well, it would. I mean, working away with one of this, would, it would have taken months. There is not a cut to be seen in there. Back in Bridges Trench, we're still no closer to finding where the miners might have lived. Did you say, Ian, in the 50s, there was ploughing all the way, bulldozing through here? The whole site was bulldozed down, levelled. So all we're seeing is disturbance. Yeah. It seems the black marks on the geophysics weren't prehistoric houses at all, but modern disturbance courtesy of the bulldozer or the plough which could mean that the archaeology that was here in the 1920s has been destroyed. Nothing in that trench. And Phil's trench looks equally unpromising. You think that there's an obvious difference between that brown stuff and that white. But you've got to remember what the character of this chalk is. It's a soft rock. Yeah. And when it gets wet, if it, it'll, it'll rot. Yes. And when it rots, and look at the way it's, it's, it's trending, that way is trending down the slope. In other words, the way True. water would run off down a slope, I think that's just a geological feature. That's going to cause our response. Yes. I can't tell from looking at the plot whether that's geological or archaeological. And there's nothing archaeological in it. Well, look, if John's got no evidence and we want to test Paul's conclusions about these dwellings, we just dig a hole down the slope and see whether we can find them. And my only concern is you're going to dig a trench and keep digging a trench. There's no guarantee we are going to hit anything. We don't know whether these dwellings are that close to Barrow. Have you got a better idea? Not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so we've abandoned two of our trenches and our 21st century technology in favour of Phil's archaeological instincts. It's much the same way that John Paul would have worked over 80 years ago. The plan now is to open a long trench right across the area where we think the dwellings might be. But a disturbing idea is taking shape. Either the settlement's been destroyed, or John Pull, archaeological pioneer and unsung hero, made a mistake. But if we can't find houses here, there's still a chance we could find them elsewhere on Black Patch Hill because John Paul said he found a second prehistoric settlement somewhere on the neighbouring farm. But tragically, his untimely death cut short his work, leaving Stuart with just one cryptic clue to its location, somewhere about 600 yards north of Myrtle Grove Farm. Well, I've, I've been going through his original text. Yes. And he actually gives us a, a very good tour of this region right down to where this site is. The north side of the valley has a deep divide about halfway along its base which passes northwards between Black Patch and Harrow Hill. And you see where the contours come up? This is that yes. deep valley coming up between them. On the western side of the chalk ridge on what is actually a projecting spur of Black Patch. So we're actually he's talking about that area in there, 600 yards from the farm puts it in that area there, which is north of the farm, as he describes, which is, there's the farm, it's actually in this field here. As not, Stuart not pinpoints the possible settlement on Myrtle Grove Farm, back on Long Furlong Farm, it looks as though we've finally found signs of Pull's excavation. Have you got anything? Uh, yes, yes, I'm very excited. This is the ditch. Do you reckon this is a ditch that Paul found? Yeah, without any doubt. Let's look at the stuff in the section here. It's very, 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 very loose. There's no way that's been there since the Neolithic. That proves absolutely that this was a, a pull ditch. And this is this thing on the GFS? It's about 15 metres diameter. What do you think it is? Well, I'm sure it's the outer ditch of a barrow. So what's 15 metres? Uh, well, run round and we'll see. All right. Yeah, away a bit, Tony. So this is a ditch round a burial mound? Yes, well, except there wasn't a mound. What do you mean? Well, it was a flat barrow. 
they do occur, it's not unusual. Barrows are mounds or ditches built over or around a burial. They're often in prominent positions, which suggests they acted as a kind of marker or focal point. And Francis now thinks that John Paul didn't excavate all of the ditch, which means there could be untouched prehistoric material waiting to be discovered. Which is just as well, because our long trench looks a lot less promising. In fact, the longer it gets, the emptier it looks. Our only hope of finding the dwellings now is to go back to John Poole's sketch map and compare it with aerial photographs taken before the site was bulldozed. But, but, but we, we've used that one to calculate that one. Yeah, but that's because it's from this, isn't it? it? Sounds simple. Yeah. They're a good 20 metres apart. Right? But it isn't. Wow, those were 200 metres apart. If we can get our sums right, then there's still a good chance we could find the houses tomorrow. It's been a frustrating first day. But our number one Flint fan has loved every minute. What do you think of that then? That is really good, and that is our one find. I know you're going to tell me that that's a scraper or something, but how can I tell that that's anything more than another old pebble? Look, you see that, that swelling? That's what we call the bulb of percussion. And that is really the, the indicator that this has actually been struck off and it is not just a stone out of the ground. It's an early Neolithic scraper. Well, fair dues, it's a great little find, but it's the only find we've got. Y yes, but, but you know, this is one of the most fundamental periods in our island story. It's that, that point where people stopped roaming around on the landscape and they actually started to settle down. They started making vast communal monuments, enormous burial mounds, and they started making settlements. They were making settlements that we can't find, Phil. Tomorrow, Tony, tomorrow. Beginning of day two here at Black Patch near Worthing, where we're looking for that holy grail of British archaeology, a Stone Age settlement. We've already rediscovered the site dug by archaeologist John Poole 80 years ago, and we're beginning to piece together what could be one of the most important Neolithic sites in Britain. But that's about half a mile in that direction, which begs the question, what am I doing here in a field which is completely empty, except for a couple of rather puzzled looking archaeologists? Archaeologists. Why are we here? Well, when John Paul was up in this area in the 1920s, he investigated that, really this whole landscape. And we know that there's one site in particular which he describes called Myrtle Grove, where he looks at a whole series of, of um, shallow depressions, which he thinks is another Stone Age settlement. Uh, he did some limited excavation there, but really the problem is because there's no photographs or drawings or, or major description in the Worthing Museum archive, archaeologists have been unable to retrace where he was at the time. Do you reckon we're in the right place? I do. I read his description very carefully, and he's a good describer of the landscape, the way he writes. And you can actually, I think, can pinpoint it exactly into this field. You rather like John Paul, don't you? I do. I think he's a landscape archaeologist in the 20s and 30s. That was a, a fairly rare beast, actually. His writing style is so good, I'd, I'd be pleased to write some of the things he's written. Would be nice if we could find something for John Paul, wouldn't it? Mm. It would. And for Geophys, that means yet another huge field. Back on Long Furlong Farm, we're extending the trench over our ring ditch in the hope that there might be more to it than just evidence of John Poole's original dig. Francis! What's this, a big area strip you've got here? Well, I reckon so, Phil. I mean, we found out last night that the ditch hadn't been fully dug out by Poole. This solid stuff on the edge is in fact the original Neolithic ditch filling. And it's going to have artifacts and we'll be able to date the feature. Ah. So it seems to me what we want to do is strip half the barrow. Yeah. Let's, you know, see what he missed on the interior, if he did miss anything. Well, I'm going to go on down there, getting some data in from Henry. Yeah. And he reckons he can actually pop me in yeah. on, on one of Paul's actual excavations. So I'll, I'll leave you to your area. Okay, right? though. I'm with my own. Good hunting. If Francis is right, there should be lots more to learn from the ring barrow and from the Neolithic houses. But finding them's proving tricky. Geophys couldn't do it, but if Henry's got his sums right, he should be able to plot their coordinates onto the ground. So, Henry, you reckon you've finally calculated the position of Paul's excavations? Yeah, well, this is going to be D2. D3's going to be over that way a bit. So oh, come on. <laughs> Come on, how have you arrived at these precise positions from this? The only feature we, we know is B9. That That's the one that Francis is digging. That's right. So 
Uh, everything's measured from there. But this isn't to scale. There's another map which has some of these features on which has a scale on it. It's a long shot. <laughs> Why don't you give me that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Walk off out there and select a spot. <laughs> Despite Phil's scepticism, we're opening two trenches over what we hope are Neolithic houses. It's our last throw of the dice. If we can't find them this way, we never will. Luckily, there's good news from Myrtle Grove Farm. Geophys think they've spotted something that could be evidence of a prehistoric house. So we're putting in yet another trench. Going onto it there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Seems quite a distinct change. That looks nice, so we just keep go back. So you're watching other people working? Well, I'm entitled every now and again to rest my weary bones. Besides, this is experimental archaeology. In what way? Well, I'm just having a nice cup of Jackie's Neolithic tea. So how do you make it, Jackie? Well, what we've done is we've put some elderflowers in the water and we've put some honey in. We had a hot stone. And I just sizzled it slightly in some water. <laughs> That's it. You going to try some? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a yeah. yeah. See? Oh, nice, isn't it? Mm. The little flowers get... <laughs> <laughs> They're nutritious. <laughs> so what else are you going to be doing? Well, we're going to be doing some experiments to see actually how people might have lived in this landscape. And we thought uh, we might make uh, Phil a new hat. <laughs> Save yourself the trouble. I don't want a new hat. There's plenty of life left in this one, yeah? Phil, that is the most disgusting, stained piece of headwear in the whole of British archaeology. While Phil enough. tries to hang on to his hat... Over in that corner, yeah. We're busy expanding our trenches on both farms. Yeah. So it is, it's curving through here. Yeah. We now know that John Poole didn't have the time or the technology to completely excavate this site. So we're picking up the story where he left off. It's a bit of a circle you got in the chalk there, isn't it? Well... On Long Furlong Farm, we found what he thought was a Neolithic dwelling. But Phil's got another theory. I don't know. I don't think it's a dwelling. I mean, what do you think about this, Sally? Well, I'm not convinced that it is a dwelling, but it did have a certain amount of domestic refuse in here. Paul found worked flint, cracked flint, fire cracked flint, so it had been in heat, bits of sandstone rubbers from grinding corn, animal bones and pottery here. What's your problem with it being a hut if there is all this domestic stuff? My, my problem is that chalk can play funny tricks on you because mm. chalk's a very soft rock. And because it's, it's soft, it will actually decompose when you get water on it, particularly if you've got root system with a tree. And what you're left with is the brown clay that is actually in the chalk. So what you can be looking at with a feature about this size is where a tree has been standing in the chalk and it tips over. And so the tree, if you like, would be standing here. Yeah. It tips over. Hold on a minute. What about all the domestic rubbish? It, it, it is still possible that, that, that you can get material that is building up in these tree throws. It's still possible that people can actually be taking shelter in the tree Ooh. throws. I just do not believe that this is, that this is a, a dwelling. And it's the same story in Bridges Trench, just the outline of another uprooted tree. These are natural features, not Neolithic houses. John Poole misinterpreted them. But why? When he came here, the landscape was, was littered with humps and hollows, mine shafts and spoil heaps and so on. And at that time, any hollow in the ground was being interpreted as pit dwellings. There, there's oh, yeah. hundreds of them in, in the archaeological yeah, records, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely right. And I mean, all the work that's been done on tree throws has been done really mm. very recently. Uh, and the fact it is a tree throw doesn't mean it isn't important. This, this could be the sort of evidence that shows us that the land is being cleared by the Neolithic people yes. for the first yeah. time. You know, yeah. It's a real imprint on the landscape. So it, it is actually quite an important excavation, even though it is just a tree hole. Move on over, yeah. Our search for the pit village is over. So instead, we focus all our energy on the ring barrow. Just down in that corner. In the desperate hope that we can make sense of what John Paul might have missed. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. And we've got our first find. What about this, then? But it's not exactly prehistoric. We've got evidence of Paul being here, look. F-R-Y... Fryco. Oh. Oh, I bet that's some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> got that. Look, you need two bottles of it, though. <laughs> Just let's get on and clear the rest of the hole out. 
Early afternoon on day two, and we're still scraping away at that ring ditch. So that's bolt, that's hole. Get the pull stuff out first. Don't take the neo stuff out till we're all absolutely happy that we've got any modern contamination off. Francis. Yeah, oh, hi, Tony. Why have we exposed all of this when we knew it was here? You got me running all the way around this about 24 hours ago. Well, the thing is, John Paul didn't dig the whole thing out. And so what we're doing now, we're removing that very, very loose stuff which had been tipped back by John Paul to get down to the un undisturbed ancient stuff. What could the stuff that he didn't dig out tell us? The stuff that he didn't see, that's going to be the stuff that went in first. So that's going to date the ditch. Precisely. So any finds in there are red hot. So why didn't he dig out more of the ditch? Well, it's, it's one of those things. People in those days, they, they weren't as thorough as us. It wasn't yeah. part of the way they thought. They wanted to get an impression of it. They didn't want to dig it scientifically as we do. But I tell you what, he did that, yeah. and he was so busy looking at the ditch yeah. that he didn't see behind him. Over here. Oh, fantastic. Could that be a burial? I think it is. Yes, I do. Well, we have one piece of bone out of it from so far. Oh, yeah. That's bone all right, don't it? Yeah. Francis. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't going to tell you about that, Tony. <laughs> is this another one here? Yeah. Oh, now, this is the money, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Thank you. Oh, relief. <laughs> <laughs> And pretty soon, we've got our first find from inside the ditch. This is the first bit of pot we got, actually, so it's quite important I mean, we want that to we date it. it. It could well be a bronze age. It's the right sort of thickness. This is really sharp edge, so yeah. it suggests that it is in situ yeah. and it hasn't been battered around on the surface before it's gone in. But it's one of just a handful of finds. We know prehistoric people were here, so we'd expect to see a lot more finds than this. So where are they? Phil and Maisie think they might have the answer. Why have you brought us here, Phil? We must be 200 metres from the rest of the day. Yeah, but... You know, we haven't got many foins in the plough soil up there. Yeah. Well, we wonder whether they're all down here. You see, when I was a student um, 30 years ago and training digs down here, they were just beginning to realise that the reason there was nothing on top of the hills was it was all washed down into the valleys. Why would it come so far? Well, gravity, partly, but, um, I mean, the, the, there's nothing else to stop it. And you're talking about thousands of years. Well, that's about the bottom, isn't it? Yep. I'm not actually sure what we're looking for. Well, we're looking for anything that may have derived from up there. This would be the obvious thing pot and it, it will have been undisturbed down there. But at the same time you've got to remember that prehistoric pottery was very very lowly fired in other yeah. words it's, it's just basically like well as you know dog biscuit mm. yeah. and so once it gets in the moisture if it, if it gets a lot of dampness in it it will just fall to bits. Oh, yeah. So it's yeah, actually it's... quite rare if we yeah. if we found Neolithic pottery in here that would be seriously rare but flints Flint, there's no good yeah. reason why we no, shouldn't no find flints. Yeah. Oh, that's got a bit of an edge on it, hasn't it? There we go. Yes, I'll, gi I'll give you that one. Rock flint. That is very sharp. <laughs> it really sharp? is, isn't yeah. it? It's, it's in beautiful condition. Yes! Oh, prehistoric what? pot. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> you can have the big bit. <laughs> We were just about to finish the scene. The director had just said, all right, everybody, let's go back up the hill. And here it is. Fantastic. Gosh, oh, it's isn't like that nice. dog biscuit, isn't it? It's tempting to carry on digging down here. But the truth is, these finds are out of context, so we can't date them, and they won't tell us anything about our site. It explains why we're not finding everyday items, the kind of things that were dropped or discarded on the surface. Is that yes. decoration that you see in it? But we are at last beginning to find things that seem to have been deliberately buried in the chalk. I mean, that, that bit there looks like it's a collar going round the rim, doesn't it? Yeah, I reckon that's what it, it is. Oh, it's wobbling. Yeah, it's wobbling, I mean, that's a good obviously. sign. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's going to come. Right, well, what is it? It's a nice big piece. Ooh, and it is decorated. Yeah, and it is a collared urn. Oh, that's fantastic. So it would have been upright like that. So what sort of date do you reckon that is? Well, it's early Bronze Age, about 1800, 1900, 1900. BC, I should think. Yeah. That is fantastic. This, this could be a cremation. And then on top of it, of course, we had this. 
And this is, when I was watching the digger, the, this was sticking up above the chalk. Mm. It's obviously a marker for this little It must pit. be. And these don't normally occur on their own, so I wouldn't be at all surprised no. if there weren't more underneath there. But uh, gosh, I think that's fantastic. Is this a cremation or something else? We're extending the trench in the hope of finding other pits and making sense of this intriguing barrow. And almost immediately, we uncover another flint marker. Back on Myrtle Grove Farm, it looks as though we could be onto something. You know your dad was supposed to have found this mysterious second settlement, but yes. there's no records around of it at all. We put this trench in here to see if we could find any evidence of it. Miles, have you come up with anything yet? That looks uh, like a cup to me. Certainly, yeah, you can yeah. see the, uh, the solid natural chalk uh, coming up here. I mean, it just takes a dive, mm. and then where Ian is digging, we, it comes up again. What we've got is a, is a cut into the side of the hill, almost like a, a terrace. And that's what exactly what you'd expect on a slope like this. If you're building a house, you terrace into the side of the hill. So theoretically, this should be uh, an area of uh, prehistoric housing. What's so frustrating is that so many of the finds and so many of the notes associated with this area have gone missing. Essentially, the flint mine site, all the finds, the archive and everything is in the museum. But all the sites around the periphery where other people were involved, uh, a lot of the material is still missing. I think it was scattered amongst a whole range of different sources. You didn't chuck it away because it was cluttering up the house. <laughs> <laughs> Not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we could confirm that your dad's work was right? Oh, that would be really wonderful. It'd be through to bits. <laughs> and the only way to confirm it is to keep on digging. At last, we're beginning to get evidence of prehistoric people living over that side of the site. But this part of the site seems completely different, doesn't it, Francis? Well, it does, actually. In the last hour, we've revealed what look like five cremations. But I really want to get back in the ring ditch. All I right. think, yes, it's the ring ditch, Tony, that really shows us everything that we need to know. John Paul, he started the book, if you like. Today we've discovered a huge amount. We've written a couple of chapters. Now what I want to do tomorrow, I want to extend right over there, finish the book, and I think if we do that, we'll be doing proper homage to John Paul. So, is that the prehistoric land of the living? Could this be the land of the dead? Let's hope we can sort it all out tomorrow. It's the beginning of day three here at Black Patch on the South Downs. And we've only got one day left to uncover the rest of this barrow and see what it can tell us about this fantastic prehistoric site. When Black Patch was first dug in the 1920s by John Pull, limited time and primitive technology meant he was only able to tell part of the story. Now, 80 years on, we're beginning to unravel the rest of what's proving to be a complicated tale. And on Myrtle Grove Farm, it looks like we can add a new chapter. John Poole thought he'd found prehistoric pit dwellings here, but Miles has another explanation. Is this one of John Poole's pit dwellings? It's certainly one of the, the potential dwelling sites that he recognised, but it's, it doesn't look like it's a pit. Uh, what I think we've got given the actual slope of the hill coming down here, is a circular cut, a, a sort of a flat terrace driven into the side of the hill onto which a, a house would have been built. Right, so does that mean they've just taken sort of the slope and cut a section out to make a flat platform? Yes. But how does that all work with the rest of the building? Well, effectively what we're doing, if you look at down in it in plan, what you sort of see is a, a semicircular cut into the side of the hill, and it's upon that you get your upright hut structure. What we should get is a circle of timber posts which would have supported the roof, and then probably an outer wall just nicely embedded up against the terrace cut. But it does look as if it's a, your classic later Bronze Age house, which is what, one and a half, two thousand years after the flint mines go out of use. So here, John Pull was spot on. 3,000 years ago, this hill was home to prehistoric people. But these were Bronze Age farmers, not Neolithic miners. So where did they live? Could they really have made this hill their home 5,000 years ago? Well, it's fairly gorgeous up here now, but it's quite blowy, isn't it? It is a bit. <laughs> and we've got portable toilets, we've got catering up here. 
It would have been very bleak for people in the Neolithic, wouldn't it? Well, not necessarily. It's a very different landscape it would have been then. There would be a lot more forests, and there would have been actually clearings appearing in the forests. In the Neolithic, they've started to have to cultivate crops and work the land, so they didn't have so much time to sit around a fire and do some cooking. So it would be the beginning of convenience foods. What do you mean by that? Well, they'd make a simple bread dough with flour and water and put it onto a hot stone in the fire. And when they came back at lunchtime, they'd have a little cup like this, which they could put some food in. What would they put in it? Well, here we have made a mixture of sea bass and wild herbs and some nuts and some butter, because okay. butter is a very big Neolithic food. That's really, really nice. Well, why should food be bad because it's Neolithic? <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? I've just got such a prejudice. I, I thought that in the Stone Age, people would eat food that I would find disgusting, but if you served that up in a restaurant today, you'd Absolutely. eat it quite happily, wouldn't you? You also threatened Phil with a new hat. Have you managed to do anything about that? That's actually a hat. Here we have it. Oh, fantastic. What's that made out of? This is just grass, and it's been made into a long plait and then sewn together with a bone needle. It'd be very interesting to see whether he adores it or whether he runs a mile. <laughs> Can I give it to him? Do. <laughs> Well, I want to get cracking on with this ditch. Meanwhile, back at our ring barrow, Phil's investigating a series of small pits outside the ditch. You think it's strange? Inside them, we found pieces of pot, stone and worked flint. Each pit was topped with a large lump of flint. Evidence that could suggest these are cremations. But Phil's not so sure. One thing I don't think it is, there's no cremated bones, so these are, I don't, I'm sure are not... Not, not, not straight cremation. Not, no. Well, I don't think they're cremation at all. At all. No. We've been discussing what they are. It's funny in a way what they've got in them. You see, virtually you get no finds at all, but in this one you've got this strange stone. Now, I just wonder, is this sarsen? Looks it, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm you sure. You know, the local sandstone. But I've not seen any sarsen on this site at all. Have you? No. But when we've got it on this site, it's in the top of a feature. Yeah. And then when you go to this one, we've got, again, virtually no finds, but one tool, one yeah. little scraper. Nice little scraper. Lovely little scraper. In that one, again, hardly any finds, but in that case, you've got a big piece of pot. Yeah. I don't know. There just does seem to be something that is... Well, I reckon that these pits filled with special things commemorate somebody's life. And that's one of the reasons why they don't cut one another. They're all carefully spaced out, just like graves in a churchyard. These big lumps of flint here, that's marking the spot. And I think the fact that they're just outside the, the barrow, I think that's very interesting, that they're put there to be close to something that was important a little bit earlier. One thing I think we can rule out is that they are not settlement. They are not somebody living here. No, absolutely not. This is about death and the ancestors. People went to great lengths to associate themselves and their ancestors with this hill. But why? Well, it's probably no coincidence. The Black Patch was home to the most fundamental and precious commodity of prehistoric life, flint shot. Until about 6,000 years ago, during the Mesolithic, flint was chipped or napped to make axes and other tools. But then Neolithic people came up with a radical new technique that involved hours of careful polishing. 20 hours work. That's a lot of effort. So was the new model more efficient or just better looking? The strange thing is, nobody knows. We've decided to find out. Eyeball to eyeball, they're like the two <laughs> champs. <laughs> We're about to conduct our own serious scientific research. Are you two taking this <laughs> seriously? Of course we are. Oh, right, are you ready? Oh, match right. fit, <laughs> match fit, soaked up. So on my left, we have the Mesolithic axe coming in at 7000 BC. And on my right, the Neolithic axe coming in at a mere 3000 BC. Well, 4000 4, at least. 4000 BC, yeah, you yeah. reckon? OK, yeah, I'll give you that. The Mesolithic axe was a masterpiece of practical design. I'm worried about the angle you're doing it at, Francis. Are you? Yeah, Stop I'm being a, a backseat driver, oh, Maisie, right, and let him get on with it. <laughs> Quick to make and easy to repair, it was in every prehistoric toolkit. Go on, have a go, Phil. Oh, round one, over. 
Oh! Oh, it's all right. <laughs> so why, about 6,000 years ago, did Neolithic people introduce a new model? <laughs> One that took days of careful grinding to make or repair. It's like being under fire here with the shrapnel. That is working a lot better. Yeah. I'll tell you what. What's that? This axe seems to leave a much cleaner cut than the Mesolithic axe. You look at that surface there. Yeah, you, you've got proper axe facets, yeah. haven't you? It's a proper yeah. blade cutting. The, the other side this is, is more bruising shred more, shredded. Yeah, it is, yeah, it's tearing shredded. it. just looks as if he's been chewing it. it was... Oh, thanks. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's compare the edges. I mean, this, this is really, the old Mesolithic one, mm. is really battered, isn't it, mate? It's really, and then it's got the wood, it's got into it's really crept into that right, it? and, and uh, I mean, that is presumably points of weakness. So over time, this Neolithic axe, um, that's going to carry on as it is, but this Mesolithic axe, where the wood has got into these little crevices, it's, it's going to get worse and worse in use. Would you, would you reckon it's sort of ten times more durable than this? That's the sort of feeling I get, I mean... Yeah. It's that sort of order of magnitude, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing, isn't that it? That is amazing. That's almost that, like that's a bronze axe. Well done, that man. <laughs> Victory to the Neo! Yes! <laughs> While our axe-wielding archaeologists exchange blows in the woods, over at our ring barrow, things are getting stranger and stranger. Miles, we whipped all this off for you this morning so you could work out what was going on with your barrow. What is it doing? Uh, it's not a barrow, for a start. You're kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, a by definition, a barrow should have a, a burial in it or some kind of burial element, and this is the one thing this site has not got. So this little hole in the middle isn't a burial? No, no, no. This looks like it's actually a, a tree hole, some kind of natural feature. We might just have a, an enclosure ditch, some defining this kind of sacred space. That doesn't look like it's for a tree. No, indeed. We've got a, a series of rather stranger features coming out here, and you can see where Ratcher's digging all this flint. Where, whereabouts has this come from, then, Ratcher? It's just been in all of this fill, really. I, I've never dug anything like it before in my life. And if you just look in the section, it's just packed with lots and lots of flint. But that all... can't be natural, can it? You wouldn't get loads of flint like that just under the sun. No, I've never seen anything quite like this before, actually. It's been extracted from a flint mine and then they've actually chosen to place all this flint back in this hole. What about in your hole, Matt? Well, it's not strictly my hole because I started off on what I thought was a feature here, but actually I'm coming around and I'm joining up with Rakshar's feature there as well. So we're actually both in the same feature, which is quite large and goes around like that. What do you think it might be? Well, it could be a shaft. A, sh a shaft, like a, a like flint, like mine, a flint mine, but one enclosed by this bank and ditch. How deep might a shaft be? Well, if, it, if we go by the shafts on the other side in the flint mining area, we could be going down six metres. Ah, and <laughs> just to remind you, it's ten to four on day three. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Which means we've got to get cracking if we're going to make sense of this weird stash of flint. But it's not our first unexpected find. We've been here for the best part of three days now, and all that time you've been sitting here in front of the trench, <laughs> good as gold. <laughs> this is taking you back to your youth, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> and I'll show you what we found in that trench there. Yes. Look, a oh. couple of pop bottles, which your dad <laughs> must have buried when he backfilled the trenches. They are Fryco. You know well, that company? Yes, I do. It's uh, quite a well-known Sussex name. So could these have been yours? It might have been the picnics we had up here with the neighbours. The picnic in the photo? Yes. <laughs> You're going to stay here till the bitter end tonight, aren't you? Oh, yes, because we must see the finale. <laughs> As we race to make sense of the barrow or mine or whatever it might be, the bigger picture is beginning to take shape. Sometime about 6,000 years ago, people came to Blackpatch. They sunk mines in search of flint and used that flint to clear the trees. After mining drew to a close, this became a sacred place. About 4,000 years ago, our ring barrow was built and ritual pits placed around it. A thousand years later, Blackpatch became what it is today, a place of settlement and farming. When I was up here two and a half days ago, I thought that I was going to be looking for a Neolithic 
residential site mm. with a few flint mines attached. But it seems to have got more and more complex as the dig's gone on. It, it's a ver they're very difficult sites to sort out flint mines. People, I think, are coming here to mine flint, but it's not just purely an industrial activity. It's a big communal activity. And when they're here, they're not just, they're not living here for like generation after generation and for hundreds of years. So when John Poole said that what we'd got here was a Neolithic settlement, he was wrong, wasn't he? No, he hadn't. He, he came and he saw pits, which he interpreted as being dwellings. He was absolutely right. At Milton Grove, that's what we've got. We've got dwellings of the Bronze Age period. He didn't notice the Bronze Age period. In fact, at that time, the distinction between the Bronze Age, the Iron Age and the Roman period was all conflated anyway. And with all the science and what, 50 or 60 years worth of advancement of knowledge in archaeology, we're still struggling to answer the questions he asked. We're certainly struggling to make sense of the ring ditch. The bottom isn't very deep. We've hit solid chalk beneath our stash of flint, which means it's not a six metre deep mine. But if it's not a mine, what is it? I mean, that's weird, isn't it? Uh, it, it is, it is. It's, it's curious to think what this might be. I mean, it's really this whole central space within the ditch. I and mean, the only other feature within the interior is this very sort of irregular tree throw hole. But no burials? No burials. I mean, over there in the flint mines, they're digging holes and they're getting flint out. And here, they're digging holes and they're putting flint back. It's, it's almost as if it was some form of a... Of a, of a burial, of a ritual, of a, you know, of offerings. And then you get the ditch goes around the outside and it sort of bounds this sacred area. And then you get those, those commemorative pits. Indeed. I, it, I think it's fantastic. It Can is. you think of another one? No, it is unique. So this barrow wasn't built to honour the dead, but to honour the two things that dominated prehistoric life here on Black Patch Hill. Flint and trees. It was flint that brought people to Black Patch, and flint that helped them to clear the trees and shape the world around them. But if he hadn't done all that stuff, yeah. we wouldn't be here. No. In just three days, we've begun to unravel 3,000 years of history. A process begun by one man, John Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks ever so much for all the work that you've done over the last three days. But before we go, there's one small presentation that we have to make to Phil. Can you take your hat off, please? <laughs> You'd forgotten, hadn't you? I, I totally. Ta da! <laughs> God! <laughs> Neolithic man. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that we've done over the past three days has been inspired by John Poole's work. And it's nice to think that we've added yet another chapter to his history of Black Patch Hill. But it's strange, isn't it, that a story that began 80 years ago with the discovery of a flint mine should have ended with evidence of almost the opposite process. People taking the mined flint and putting it back into the ground. <laughs>